Alex, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you making time this afternoon for us. Oh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you. Alex, I've been listening to your content. I've been really excited to do this conversation. I've been trying to absorb some of the things that you've been saying in your work. Um, I'm excited to get into it. I know some of my colleagues have been asking questions about how some of these things will actually work in the real world. But why don't you kind of start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to over the last handful of years? Sure. So um, I am a director of research and innovation at 40 Week Global, which is a nonprofit that, as the name suggests, works with companies and sort of other kinds of organizations to implement four day weeks or other kinds of shorter work weeks without reducing people's salaries or reducing, you know, customer service or sort of playing with deadlines or changing, you know, sort of changing other things in sort of output or productivity. And I got into that after sort of writing a book about the movement that came out a couple years ago called Shorter that looked at about a hundred companies around the world that had sort of done this before the pandemic. And that book in turn was kind of a sequel to an earlier book that I'd written called Rest, which was about the way in which highly creative people use rest to have better ideas and sort of more sustainable careers and better lives. And so Shorter was kind of about how you could put this into practice at scale for, you know, everybody in a company rather than just for yourself. Um, and so, you know, now I'm trying to help uh, lots of companies put it into practice. So that's, you know, that's me and what I do. How did you get into the topic of rest and shorter work weeks? And you seem like you've done a lot of work. You're very creative. Um, how did you get kind of locked on this topic? Right. You know, um, I live in Silicon Valley where, you know, sort of overwork is basically like a secular religion. And so for me, sort of, uh, discovering the value of rest was partly a personal thing, which happened after a particularly kind of challenging stretch of work a number of years ago where sort of I ended up kind of getting burned out and needing to take a break. But you know, it also connects with a long interest that I had had in kind of the mechanics or psychology of creativity. This is something that I studied in college and you know, it has always been really fascinating to me, you know, how it is that people come up with really brilliant ideas or sort of insights. And I realized at a, sort of a certain point when I was on a sabbatical at Microsoft Research in or to Cambridge that, you know, I was doing all kinds of really interesting stuff. I was reading a lot, having great conversations, but I didn't feel the kind and, and my wife and I were going off on weekends to, you know, cool places. And yet I was getting an awful lot done. And it made me think that, you know, maybe our assumptions that you have to be you know, always on and always connected and constantly working in order to do really interesting stuff was actually wrong. And that there was an important place for sort of rest or leisure or downtime in or of, uh, in or to cre ambitious creative lives. And so that basic idea was one that I started sort of trying to trace out in you know, neuroscience and psychology of creativity and sort of biographies of really uh, sort of creative and successful people. And it turns out that there is a story to be told about sort of uh, about rest and leisure as something that plays a really important role in sort of the daily routines of sort of uh, of prolific and imaginative people that also plays a role in kind of regulating their lives or sort of helping them sort of stay balanced and I think helps them have longer, more creative lives. When I finished that, so, you know, that's the, that's the kind of backstory to rest. One of the challenges with that book, though, was having a, made the case for the importance of rest for creative people. There was still the question that, you know, I got a lot when I was promoting the book, which was, okay, so if I'm working a nine to five job, 
how do I put this into practice in my own, you know, sort of in my own life, in my own company? And I honestly did not have a very good answer. And so I went looking for one. And that search eventually yielded um, sort of companies that were moving to four-day weeks or other kinds of shorter work weeks who were doing so in part to put the lessons of rest into practice for everybody, right? Not just executives or people at the top or people who were recognized as the very highest performers, but everybody from the C-suite down to, or of, uh, you know, sort of sous chefs or sort of assistants. And that seemed to me to offer a really compelling model for sort of how to, uh, for how to put rest into practice in ways that served everybody, not just sort of the you know not just the elite of a company or sort of uh, the people who were sort of most privileged, but it also turned out to have real benefits for organizations as well as for individuals, and also turned out to be a lot more diverse than I expected. Right? It sounds like the kind of thing that is just. You know, you can imagine like an advertising agency or some sort of creative firm with, you know, sort of really long deadlines and super fuzzy standards about what good work looks like. They could do it. But, you know, in the real world where people are, you know, actually making products or shipping things or serving others, doesn't sound like at first glance the sort of thing that you could do. But it turns out that it's something that um, is being done in you know, uh, manufacturing in hospitals. There's even a police department that is currently conducting a trial of or a four day weeks for its officers. And so there's a lot more variety to it than, or, uh, or accessibility than um, it might seem at first glance, which to me made it something that was really worth studying and, um, also worth promoting. So that's the backstory. Yeah. So what, obviously, I think a lot of people are listening right now. They're thinking of their job. I'm thinking of our logistics company that kind of before we started, I told you we ship five, six thousand packages a day. What's the most common objection that you receive from people? Because it sounds like you just began to say, well, maybe that works for an ad agency, but we're a logistics company. The Postal Service ships five and six days a week and we have to get our packages to customers in two days you know sometimes they even want it faster that's just not practical for my company how do you kind of begin to contend with that idea right so one of the big objections is you know uh, customers will never stand for it uh, or you know my clients will sort of rebel if i sort of suggest doing this and I think that the, uh, that, that, you know, I've worked now with hundreds of companies around the world that, uh, and have so far heard one story from one company of a client firing them because they thought the four day week was, you know, sort of was just a pipe dream. Um, another company that fired one of its client, a four day week company that fired one of its clients because sort of they were or of uh, they were super skeptical and raised objections, and that's been it. And it's turned out that or of for you know businesses for very relationship driven businesses, right? Or of that, uh, so long as you explain it well, it's something that most you know most people are at least cautiously interested in and you know sometimes even see it as as something that they would be interested in being being able to implement in their own companies and so if you can figure out how to do it maybe there are things that you can learn that you can teach them and then in the case of you know retail establishments for example or you know nursing homes places that have fixed schedules where you know, you don't necessarily have one day of the week where there's not a lot of business happening or where contractually you have to remain open. There are other things that the organization will do. Sometimes you'll have kind of an A and B team, one group working Monday through Thursday, the other Tuesday through Friday. So in 
um, call centers or, you know, or customer success departments. This is a pretty common thing. There's actually a legit, um, a shipping company called EES Shipping in Perth, Australia. They specialize in doing international shipping, as you might expect from, you know, order of a place in Australia. And they uh, sort of, they're about a 20 person or so sort of company. And they have, um, a schedule in which everybody is in the office on Wednesday. So that's when they also do all their meetings. And then they have um, four teams, each one taking Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, or Friday off. So they're at like 80% staff four days of the week and 100% sort of uh, the other. And that's how they find they're able to, uh, to, uh, to serve sort of their customers best. But there were really a lot of different kinds of schedules that organizations find that they can put into practice, depending upon the rhythm of the work, the demands of clients, sort of the, you know, sort of the nature of what it is that sort of they are, sort of they're producing. And then also sort of economic or, or, or financial questions like um, how much it costs to keep someone or to maybe staff up a little bit versus how much it costs to hire and train a new person or sort of to bring in temporary workers sort of to sort of fill in, you know, sort of fill in gaps in a shift schedule. And so for a place like a nursing home, for example, you know, you always need a minimum number of nurses on the floor at, you know, or of at any time. And so if you're short staffed, you've got to hire out, right? You have to call for sort of temporary folks. And this is money that can really add up because you're calling people, you know, people in at the last minute. And what nursing homes have found is that even in the jobs where there's normally pretty high turnover, um, actually hiring more people sort of when you move to a shorter work week gets easier because it's a more attractive job. Um, retention also gets better and also outcomes are improved because nurses and sort of, uh, nurses and residents get to know each other a little better, you know, or if you have people maybe with dementia or other memory issues who, you know, who, whose lives are much better when they have familiar faces around and the cost of hiring new people turns out to, uh, to be pretty close to the same sort of cost the same as bringing in temporary workers. Um, so economically it even turns out sort of to sort of to even out. Mm, interesting. Let's be really clear about what this is and what this is not. Presumably you do not consider four 10 hour days, a four day work week, right? Cause I'm sure some people are thinking, okay, whatever, we'll do four tens. That probably could work for us. Right. You know, there are, there are plenty of places that do four 10 hour days. And I think that the, you know, it, um, it's not something that, uh, that we work with companies sort of to, to do because most places can figure that out, figure that out for themselves. They don't need, they don't need help, right? It, you're basically kind of moving squares around on the, sort of on the calendar. Um, I think that there, you know, that there is a kind of split of opinion in that, People either love the three-day week more than they hate working 10-hour days or vice versa, right? And so the question of whether it's a net benefit for you depends upon how you feel about longer days versus sort of longer weekends. Um, there's also, I mean, there is evidence that uh, that productivity goes down after about eight hours. I was and, that, yeah. you know, and so... There, depending upon the kind of work you're doing, you may act, you know, you may see a dip in order productivity or of by the end of the week. Um, but, you know, I think that really depends on or the kind of business you're doing. Mm, yeah, I know a lot of people in the medical field, they do four 10 hour days. Right. And that always was a little concerning to me because I would hear that they're just so tired by the time they get to the end of that shift or surgeons right. who they have like an open-ended time of their day. I have six surgeries and I'm done when the surgeries are done. But it's like, I don't want to be that sixth surgery. You've already been going for like 14 hours. And now you're like, I just want to get home, but 
I got to do a craniotomy on this guy. Like, ah, let me be the first guy. Let me get, be the guy early in the morning. Definitely. No, you know, and I think there's, uh, you know, places like hospitals, professions like or healthcare, law enforcement, it is absolutely the case that they face particular challenges in that they're often people are very perfectionist or of hard driving. Um, and at the same time, you know, long hours are kind of an occupational hazard, but the costs of mistakes can be really high, right? Whether you are trying to, you know, diagnose someone in an emergency room or you're trying to, you know, diffuse a situation or of in, you know, with, sort of, uh, with someone who's, you know, who's, you know, who's been abusive or aggressive, being, it really makes a big difference whether you are or of, uh, you know, it, it, tired, fatigued um, at the end of a shift versus uh, versus the beginning of one or the end of the week versus the beginning. And so, you know, in those fields, I think what we're seeing is some pretty compelling data that tells us that sort of shorter weeks really have serious benefits both for, you know, both for workers and for the people they're working with. Yeah, you said it. The police thing, I think that's a very compelling one because we know that our police force, not only are they overworked, but they're encountering just the worst situations over and over again. And right. I've heard from police officers and people in the military, you don't get any time to process what just happened. It's like, okay, got another call. You know, we... I just unfortunately saw something terrible in an accident on the highway, but I got to go move on and deal with this next thing that's going on. I would think that rest would be really important. We've seen that police, they sometimes don't make great decisions. And yes, there's an amount of training there, but also an amount of how high stressed are they? How much rest have they had? How long have they been working on that single given day in a stressful environment over and over again? Some police stations, I know they can't get enough people, so they're doing more overtime, not less work. So you can see how that could stack up and lead to bad decisions, whether you're a good person at your job or not. Yeah. And, you know, even you know, rates of things like traffic accidents sort of go up substantially when people are working double shifts for, you know, sort of extended periods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the one of the leading sort of fatigue is implicated in a substantial number of sort of accidents that you know that uh, that police officers have you know just driving home from work mm. or you know can be a factor as well in um you know in incidents that you know end up getting reviewed or you know or on the news for the wrong reasons so you know, and it absolutely is having a beneficial impact on recruitment and retention in Golden, Colorado, which is where sort of the trial is going on. And the and uh, it's even saving some money, right? It turns out it costs something like a hundred fifty or a hundred sixty thousand dollars to send a new hire through the police academy and get them all trained up, and so. Any person who you can keep for another year, um, you know, on the job, especially doing the job well, is, you know, that's sort of that's that's actually money you're saving compared to being short staffed while you're bringing someone up who can, you know, start in, you know, six or eight months. Yeah, I think there's some statistic about surgeons after long days on their drives home. And the likelihood that they'll get into an accident, which will send them back into the trauma center that they just came from. I'm right. sure you're probably aware of that. Um, <clears throat> so that seems I'm still I'm still with you, Alex. Uh, it seems really understandable in high stress environments, seems understandable in creative environments. And obviously, we'll talk about how rest impacts creativity, because I know that's how you sort of got into this. But what about someone where. There's a relatively close link between the amount of time that they work and their level of productivity. So for my business, we have people who ship packages. Um, there are some that are faster than others, but there's sort of a standard. You're either going to ship 
six tenths of a unit per minute, or you're going to ship one to 1.2 units per minute. But you're in a relatively tight band there, whether you're the high performer or low performer. How would you think about a situation like that, where if my company goes from 40 hours a week down to, let's call it 32 or 30, wouldn't we have a equivalent amount of decrease in output that we are paying for? Yeah, I think sort of um, a couple things that I would look at or first are whether uh, uh, whether moving to or of uh, let's say 32 hour week would have a significant impact on sort of your ability to sort of retain people, right? If it's the case that or that or uh, that you've got high turnover and it takes you know a certain amount of time to train people to the level where or if they can perform really well then it may be that um, you can see enough, you know, enough of a boost in productivity and savings in cost of hiring, training, et cetera, so that this makes sense. The second, que you know, the second thing I would look at is, is this a kind of work in which everybody is essentially working by themselves, right? Is, or if, you know, you're packing and shipping things sort of, or if, uh, just, you know, sort of yourself or is this, you know, is this part of a workflow, part of a process? And if so, or of are there gain, uh, are there systemic gains that or of, uh, that you can put into place that will make sort of everybody sort of more efficient or more productive? The four day in that case, a four day week turns out to offer a really good incentive for people to think about how they do their jobs, how they work together, and how they can do both of those things better. Because if you're able you know, to uh, sort of to work more efficiently and be part of an environment that lets your colleagues work more efficiently, then sort of the payoff is you get a three-day weekend, right? It's a very tight feedback loop between sort of what you're doing Monday through Thursday and the reward versus, you know, some more abstract kind of sort of payout in the form of a healthier company or, you know, better stock price six months from now. Um, and so if either of those two conditions apply in your organization, then that's a clearer path to working uh, or to, uh, to making a sort of a four day week viable. Yeah, it kind of makes me think about Parkinson's law, right? The uh, work always expands to fill the time that you have, whether you're in the office or not. Do you right. see that effect with companies where they go, Hey, we got 30 hours. Like we need to get our stuff done in 30 hours. And you almost work backwards to figure out how do we do this now? Right No, That's exactly what some of them will do is sort of, you know, imagine they've got a blank sheet of paper and sort of the, you know, the, and the one, you know, the first thing you write on it is 30 or 32 hours and the amount of work you got to get done and you say all right never mind how we're doing it now or if given these two conditions how would we make this happen mm -hmm. and then from you know from the answer you you come up with there you work backwards and say all right what do we need to change in what we're doing now in order to get to sort of this or of other place you know the other the mention of parkinson's law also points to another thing that can be pretty important with or of deciding whether you can move to sort of a four day week, which is how much kind of administrative overhead time or of are you spending in things like meetings or how much time are you spending or of you know dealing with outmoded or of or unnecessarily complex technology. Um, in office environments, there are studies that tell us that people or lose between two to three hours of productive time every day to overly long meetings, to badly used technology, to outmoded processes, or to other, you know, or to just general disruptions, right? The one quick question that turns into a 10 minute side conversation. And so what that means is in a lot of places, the four day week is already here. It's just that you're still coming in on Friday, sitting around in meetings, trying to figure out or of how to change the toner cartridge and or of you know and trying to or of troubleshoot some other thing. So 
if you can, if you're in an environment in which you're able to deal with those things, that's another way in which it can become possible to do in four days the same amount of work that you're currently doing in five. Yeah, it's almost uh, like you have a deadline now and, you know, whether or not you want to finish this tonight, you have to finish this tonight. Is it sort of like that? I know you wouldn't advocate for working like that. It, you'd advocate for sort of the opposite, but you have goals that you have to hit in a shorter period of time. And thus you have to do what you have to do to accomplish those things. Right. <laughs> it's almost like if you would lose half your workforce, you'd go, all right, well, we need to figure out how to do our job with half the workforce. And that would, yes, you could say, well, everyone's going to work much longer hours and probably on day one you would, but instead you'd go, all right, well, we need to automate some things. We need to buy some machinery. We need to get rid of some processes. We need to get rid of some things that we were doing previously that weren't really profitable for the business. Yeah. You know, and this is something that, you know, that kind of questioning about how we work and sort of how we can do pretty much everything differently is very much something, you know, th that's a conversation that goes on sort of at a lot of different levels in companies that move to 40 weeks. And I think that you know, one of the things that's really, that distinguishes the successful ones from the unsuccessful is that in the successful places, this is, you know, everybody is part of that, right? No CEO or line manager knows everybody's job well enough to redesign it for them and tell them how to do it 20% more or of effectively. But if you have employees who have been doing their jobs for a while, who maybe have been in their profession for a few years, who have some skill and also some or of you know, experience with or of uh, that lets them say, you know, the way in which we do things now is okay, but we could really move the needle if we did this, right? The four-day week is an opportunity to take all of those this statements and test them out, put them into practice, see which ones actually work. And so, you know, in the places it, where, you know, five years later, they're still doing a four-day week are places in which everybody was, had the opportunity to ask that question and sort of to test out their own answers. Interesting. Um, you talked a lot about our relationship with rest and vacation and work days, because I know you did a lot of research on this. Maybe just take me back a little bit in terms of the history of how we used to view rest and leisure and vacations and even the length of work days and time of work days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, I think that it, you, the, first off, the five day week itself, right? The 40 hour week is a relatively new phenomenon. It's something that would have, we've really had for the last hundred years or so, and was sort of a product of sort of the, you know, America's industrial era, you know, at the same time, you know, interestingly, while the 40 hour week is a relatively new thing and was sort of one for sort of workers as a way of protecting their free time, it also used to be the case that sort of at least for sort of, uh, you know, sort of for people who were um, sort of, uh, luckier, who were sort of, you know, uh, who had sort of more money, um, you know, they were folks for whom leisure was something that they often took pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, I was reading the, the founder of Forbes magazine, a guy named Bertie Charles Forbes, or of you, in the 1910s and 20s, wrote a bunch of biographies or sketches of sort of famous, you know, titans of industry like, you know, Carnegie and J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller and DuPont and folks like that. And one of the things that he talked about really often was how seriously these guys took their hobbies. And these were, you know, and they, uh, they had a vision of work in which they worked intensely hard, but that was also balanced out by or of periods of rest by, you know, vacations in the summer by or of long holidays. And they often had pretty serious hobbies that they were or of quite devoted to. And there was an idea that, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, 
you could claim as a reward for success was more leisure time. Mm. And this is, you know, and this is something that has kind of evaporated in the last, you know, generation or so, right? The, you know, are, if you think about sort of the, the public image of some of our richest, you know, sort of richest, most successful people, right? The, the that's, that's one in which sort of we see them as sort of working enormously hard hours, despite the fact that they are worth, you know, billions and billions of dollars. And it's no, and f for a whole bunch of reasons, we have lost the idea that sort of either leisure is something that is sort of an important part of a successful life or that it is a, or that it should be seen as sort of a reward for success, something that you can kind of grow into over the sort of, you know, or of, uh, over the course of your life and career. And it's been replaced with one in which you kind of, as, you know, Lonely Island or sort of put it, you never stop, never stopping. Um, and this is, you know, the reasons for it are manifold and sort of complicated, but, you know, the bottom line is that we've grown up in a world that assumes that, you know, overwork is just, you know, it's, uh, it's either kind of a default state or it's a necessity for success that in, we need to be always on and always connected in order to do sort of good work. And that this is a system that is impossible to escape. And it really takes, you know, it takes something like a health crisis or a crisis in a company for individuals or for organizations to sort of stop and think, you know, is it possible to work differently? Is it possible to craft a different relationship between sort of work and time and productivity and to take that seriously enough to try something as different as either, you know, a four day week for organizations or to discover at the individual level ways of working that sort of do a better job of making space for rest and allow you more time for recovery so that you can work better. I think the billionaire that everyone believes you're talking about is Elon Musk. He's running, I don't know, six, seven, eight companies, right? And he famously just apparently works 12, 14, maybe even 16 hours a day. He's trying to make us an interplanetary species. What would be your message to someone who goes, well, if I want to be like Elon, I want to be extremely wealthy. Uh, he's working 16 hours a day. And what would be your message to someone like Elon Musk about their work habits? You well, know, Elon's not going to listen to me, but probably not going to listen to either of us. Or, no, that's true. Yeah. You know, maybe he will, but you know, I mean, I did that. Uh, I am, I am a little sympathetic to Anand Gary Hadaris's sort of line that every billionaire is a policy failure. Um, at, however, I think that the, you know, at, at the very least, I would say that, you know, if you look at, you know, that, or of an Elon Musk style 18 to 20 hour days for, you know, 30 years is not the only model for, or of, uh, for, uh, achieving great success. That if you look at, you know, like Henry Ford or Pierre Dupont, you know, or to, uh, the Coleman Dupont, right? These are people who were industrial Titans who did amazing stuff, but who also still were able in their daily lives and sort of across, you know, across the sort of the seasons made a lot of time for sort of family, for sort of breaks. And that this is part of the reason that we have like foundations and libraries and things that still bear or, they, you know, or that still bear their names and sort of, and their likenesses and that, you know, there is, I, I guess the other, you know, the other thing worth pointing out is that there's an awful lot of research that tells us that um, if you are ultra wealthy, getting the next $20 million or the next billion is not actually going to make you a lot happier. Um, that the, you know, or if you ask anyone at any income level, 
pretty much, how much m more money you need in order to finally be happy. And the answer is somewhere between two and three times as much. And it doesn't matter if that's if you've got 50 million or 500 million. Right. And part of what that tells us is that if, you know, part of what you are trying to do is achieve a sort of level of, per, you know, sort of uh, permanent contentedness, that's not going to come from, or of, you know, from growing your net worth. Um, it's going to come from other places that sort of may have, uh, may ultimately have nothing to do sort of with sort of your bank account and everything to do with sort of the rest of your life. So, you know, that's the, that's the advice I'd give. Yeah. It, I believe it's called hedonistic adaptation where you, you become wealthy and you buy the Ferrari that you always wanted. And then a year from now it's Tuesday and you walk out and you look at the Ferrari and you go, I mean, it's just, it's just the Ferrari, you know, whatever I've driven it a bunch of times and it's cool, but I get it. It is what it is. Now you sort of, become accustomed to what you have and then you always are still chasing that next new thing instead right. of being pleased with the things that you do have. Another person said, um, you've already accomplished so many of the things that you told yourself would make you happy. So it's like, oh, if I start a company, I'll be happy. If it reaches a million dollars in sales, I'll be happy. If it reaches 15 million in sales, I'll be happy. Well, you've already done those things and looking mm -hmm. back into the past and do you deem yourself happy? So the happiness thing, that's a, a more difficult one that I think uh, probably takes longer to think about and plan for. Um, but, but also on the topic of Elon, you wrote in your book that rest has extremely significant changes to your brain and your mental state, um, whether that be a vacation or day off or just breaks throughout your day to day. Can you maybe touch on what is happening to your brain as you're taking time off from work? Sure. So, you know, um, one of the really interesting findings in neuroscience about 30 years ago was the discovery of something called, that they call the default mode network. And sort of, uh, they discovered it when they were kind of cal it, uh, calibrating um, fMRI machines, right? The things that do those pretty pictures of, you know, or of, of your brain. And if you tell someone to just sit in one of these and don't think about anything at all, you might expect that your brain kind of goes quiet, that those colors become less vivid. But it turns out that our brains don't. What happens is that, in fact, our brains are just as active when it feels like we're spacing out or thinking about nothing. It's just that they're, uh, the connections between different parts of our brain sort of get activated in different sorts of ways than they are when we are sort of consciously sort of trying to solve problems or focusing on something. And the default mode network, it turns out, is something that switches on super quickly, sometimes in the time it takes us to blink sort of our eyes. So like hundreds of or hundreds of milliseconds. It's also associated with creative thinking, with visualization, with thinking about sort of the past, ruminating on the past or thinking about the future. And it's also implicated in trying to work, it, it really loves, it's very attracted by unsolved problems. Things that we have been thinking about but haven't been able quite to solve. And the default mode will work on these without our sort of conscious effort, without sort of bidding, um, just sort of automatically. And this is something that happens all the time. So, you know, you're trying to remember the name of the actor who is in the thing and also the TV show and this other thing. And sort of you, you know, it's on the tip of your tongue, but you can't remember it. And then two minutes later, you're doing something else and wait, the name pops into your head, yeah. right? That's the default mode network continuing to work on a problem mm. even as your conscious attention is sort of placed somewhere else. That's a great and example. yeah, and you know, what, uh, and so when you look at sort of the, the daily routines of really creative people, one of the things you see is them alternating these periods of deep focused work where you're, you know, really concentrating hard, you're in flow. You know, you're, you are able to work in a highly focused, highly productive manner 
but layered with periods where you're taking breaks, going on walks, working in the garden, doing something else that's pretty sort of low intensity and that looks unproductive, but is actually giving the default mode a chance to continue working on unsolved problems that you haven't been able sort of to solve through like sheer force of will. And the thing, and it seems that this is something that our minds get better at with practice. When, you know, if you have that kind of routine, then these sorts of breaks, and they don't have to be terribly long, right? We're talking about like, you know, 15 to 30 minutes is often enough to get this effect going. But if you do this on a regular basis, your kind of creative subconscious comes to recognize that it's pro that it's going to have a chance to do its thing. And so you get both the benefits of sort of being able to take a walk, stare into the middle distance rather than a screen, but you also have the additional benefit of sort of your uh, of the default mode being able to work on these problems. So that's one really important lesson I think from sort of the science about what goes on in our brains in this particular period of rest and why it's valuable. A second, you know, the second one that I'll I'll mention is um, sort of the value of sleep, where you know again we're not really conscious that sort of much is happening. But um, this is a period when there's a lot happening at the level of consolidation of sort of memory, but also our brains themselves are doing an awful lot of kind of biological housekeeping. This is the period when, for example, um, our brain's glyphic system, which is, you know, there's the, like the gray matter of the neurons uh, that are you know, in which, uh, uh, that are, uh, that we use for sort of thinking. Um, but then there's a whole support system, a sort of scaffolding. And when we sleep, that scaffolding goes into action and, uh, or, and, um, makes sort of repairs, clears out sort of, um, beta amyloid plaques or proteins, and generally does the sort of maintenance work that seems to be implicated with lower levels of sort of dementias or other chronic diseases later on in life, and which essentially helps sort of keep our sort of keep our brains healthy. So, you know, both at the kind of psychological level of problem solving and at the sort of neurological level of keeping our sort of brains healthy, um, rest turns out to be or sort of you know not a kind of negative space defined by the absence of work or something unproductive, but turns out to actually be really, really important. And there's been a lot of important discoveries uh, by people and scientists and creative types that have sort of used this idea of set the problem down, go relax and or walk. And I know there's some specific science about walking, but maybe can you just touch on some of the things that we know in our daily life or stories that would resonate with people. Yeah. So, you know, the sort of walking is a walk is, a, a, you know, a great example. Um, it's a relatively simple activity. It's, you know, for most of us, you know, something we can do for free. Um, but there is, you know, but studies do tell us that sort of walking helps to stimulate creativity independent of sort of where you're walking and sort of in uh, and independent of sort of your surroundings so you get a creative boost it can you talk about that specific study that you're citing because i read yeah, in the book sure. and that was fascinating right now this is a this is a study by a couple um scientists at stanford sort of led by um uh, someone named merrily opezo and what they they uh, they did a study where they looked at um, people walking on a treadmill facing like a concrete wall that was painted beige, um, people taking a walk out around the Stanford campus, and then people who were pushed around in a wheelchair around the campus, and then people who just like sat in a room. And after, you know, after doing each of these things for a few minutes, did some creativity tests, and what they found was that 
the people who were walking got a bigger boost. Um, the people who had just been sitting in the room sort of didn't really see any boost. And the people who were kind of pushed around who in the wheelchair got a little bit of stimulation. But what this tells us is that the physical act of walking is the more is the thing that or uh, that uh, kind of prepares us for or primes us for sort of some, uh, for sort of uh, higher levels of creativity. Um, walking in a nice place is you know that's like a nice add-on, but it's really the physical walking itself that turns out to be sort of valuable. Exactly why this is, we're not a hundred percent sure. But it's, you know, it confirms what tons of writers and philosophers and other people have, uh, you know, have told us for a very long time, it, you know, which is that um, walking is a great way to shake loose ideas to sort of, you know, put us in a sort of state of mind where we can have new insights. Um, you know, it's something that is used by um, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, you know, Buddhist monks as part of a, you know, kind of meditative practice, or, you know, for that matter, there's the, you know, the tradition of, you know, the Catholic labyrinth of, you know, walking through and sort of using those as an opportunity for, you know, spiritual contemplation. And so, you know, all of these are examples of the way in which walking can help us Sort of go into a different kind of mental state that makes us more receptive to new ideas and helps us be sort of or of more more thoughtful and contemplative. The other really great example is um, vacations, which turn out to be a place in which something like twenty percent of new ideas for startups are of are sort of formulated. And I mean, my favorite example of, you know, or of an insight during vacation comes from Lin-Manuel Miranda, who had been working on In the Heights for something like seven years, right, performing it on Broadway, and was finally convinced by his spouse to sort of take a break and go on vacation. And at the last minute, threw in a copy of Ron Chernow's biography of Alexander Hamilton. And he said, as soon as I gave my mind a break from In the Heights, Hamilton jumped into it mm. and it, re but you know, it required getting away from Broadway, you know, or sort of going to a resort in, I think in this case, Puerto Rico and, you know, just having some time away for, you know, sort of for the possibilities of Hamilton's story to start to become apparent to him. And as someone who is the spouse of an eighth grade history teacher um, who has seen Hamilton more times than I want to admit. Um, you know, this is a, a vacation that has had a material sort of material impact on and benefit on sort of my own life, as well as my whole family and millions of people. Do you think that that vacation matters where you go? What if I did a staycation? I stayed at home. Would I have that same bump in creativity? Do you think? Great question. Um, the, Evidence suggests that getting away does have benefit. Um, it doesn't necessarily make the difference between, you know, writing Hamilton and, you know, sort of writing something that's not successful. I think that the, you know, I will say the only bad vacation is the one that you don't take. The science is pretty clear on that, right? After that, it's, there is so much variability in, how much novelty we need in how many days away or of uh, you need in order to feel fully restored that it's really difficult to say, you know, if you go to this kind of place for, you know, eight days, you'll get this benefit. Whereas if you go, you know, somewhere else for 14, you'll get this other kind of benefit. Humans just don't work in or of, a predictable enough way to be able to do that. Um, so I, th but I think that, you know, you can't, you certainly can get benefits from sort of doing things out uh, even close to home that are sort of outside of your normal routine or that in some other kind of way kind of take you out of your, 
take you out of your regular life for or of for a time yeah you said that a vacation or taking regular vacation lowers your risk of a cardiac event is that correct yeah no there's there are long term studies that tell us that you know people who go on vacations regularly are less prone to or of heart attacks, other kinds of chronic diseases, lower stress levels. Um, late in life, they tend to be healthier. So, you know, rather than you know, living for the last 10 years in a wheelchair or with chronic diseases, you're likely to be healthier, clo you know, sort of for, or, uh, you know, sort of closer to the end. Um, and I think that the, you know, the cardiac stuff, there's, uh, comes from a long-term study called the Framingham Heart Study. And the benefits there, I think it was demonstrated, were sort of, you know, were, were, were pretty substantial. Between or having lower stress levels, um, between taking vacations being uh, also sort of kind of connected with more generally a greater degree of seriousness of taking care of yourself, and therefore more likely, you know, being a little more likely to exercise regularly or do other things that we know are good for sort of your heart. All of that stuff kind of combined um, or of turns out to uh, or of to work together or to uh, to lower the odds of heart attack strokes and other kinds of cardiovascular events. I guess both with this one and then also with happiness of employees related to the four day work week. How do you parse out what is cause and effect versus what is sort of the chicken and egg problem, right? If I, if my company goes to a four day work week, I probably care quite a lot about my employees and I'm probably doing 15 other things to show my employees that I care. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you would think that employees would rate happiness higher at my company than they would at other companies. Same thing that is true with that vacation study. If you're willing to take vacations, uh, well, you probably have a little bit higher of an income, right? You can actually take those vacations. And then you're probably more in tune with rest and relaxation and turning off instead of just, I just want to stay home and do my job and come back and drink my two beers and go to bed. Right. So I think that the... Um Sort of one of the places to look for evidence of the value of of sort of of vacations is in sort of people who um, who haven't always taken them, but do so you know after a health scare or something else sort of convinces them that they need to make changes, right? And I think that the uh, there is some you know. That's not as large or well studied a group, but I think that there is evidence from them that indicates that people who make this kind of change, or of who and and in a sense who express it in the form of or of more time, you know, sort of taking taking more time off and taking that time more seriously, or of do you know, sort of do get these kinds of benefits, um, you know the. I think that uh, that with four day week companies, you know, it definitely is the case that some of them come to the four day week having, you know, done other things that they've uh, in a quest to become employers of choice or better places to work, and they see the four day week as a kind of natural next step in sort of their evolution as a great workplace. In other cases. It is, you know, they are, you know, let's say restaurants, for example, where the founder and everybody else have been working 13 hour days for weeks on end. And the head chef realizes if we keep going like this, you know, or if everybody's going to quit and I'm going to have a heart attack. And so, you know, whether so whether it is a company that has sort of a long interest in the welfare of its employees, or whether it's a place for whom the four-day week is a dramatic break from order tradition, you see in both cases sort of increases in happiness levels, reductions in stress, or of uh, you know, or of etc. And so, I think 
you know, you are right that the, sort of to suggest that in some cases there is a sort of sort of uh, you know a kind of um, cultural position or attitude that leads some companies toward a four day week. But in other cases, there are ones in which implementing the four day week is the thing that sort of drives the change in sort of culture. So I, you know, so long as you end up sort of in a better place, doesn't ma- doesn't really matter to me sort of you know which side you started on. But you know, you're gonna sort of your life and your employees' lives will be better sort of once you get there. Interesting. Uh, another thing you talked about already, but mentioned very heavily in your book, is sleep, um, specifically napping. Um, how do I go about convincing the rest of my office staff that I need a nap at midday? <laughs> you know, the way that we used to do this, the way you used uh, was to sort of all do it at the same time. You know, sort of there was. It, uh, well, in foreign countries, that's still very common. You know, absolutely. Uh, you know, American countries, they roll the sidewalk up at two o'clock. Like you are not going to go into a shop between two and maybe even sometimes like 7 p.m. We would try to go to a restaurant when I was in uh, Uruguay and the restaurants would just not be open from midday right. to seven. And you walk in and they're like prepping food and they're like, Oh, we're not, we're not open. Like you can't <laughs> eat here right now. We're like, it's five o'clock. What do you mean? I can't eat here. They're like, no, we open at seven. I'm like, these people don't know how to do business. They're, they're ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, in Asian countries, in Japan, for example, or if it used to be the case that in offices, you basically you took a nap when the, or if, when the boss did, you know, you do everything when the boss does. Um, and so sort of when after lunch, they would, you know, most people would sleep at their desks. So there's a, you know, there's, there's sort of a code for it, right? Or if you sleep at your desk, you don't lie down. Um, you, it's fine to nap as long as the boss does. And then once he gets up, then it's time to go back to work. But, you know, the fact that everyone did it removed sort of a, uh, or of, you know, legitimated it, removed sort of the social stigma. It is, you know, in these days, there are some more enlightened places that have like the expensive nap pod or sort of something that will, you know, that that signals that it's, you know, it's okay to take like a 20 minute nap um, if you, you know, if you need. But I think that it is, you know, that it's really easy for sort of bosses to see this as, you know, uh, you know, something that, you know, you should not be doing right. Sleeping on the job is generally not sort of seen as a compliment or as something that you want to encourage. And, you know, certainly in industrial era, um, you know, if you're on a, or if, uh, if you're, you know, you're working on a sort of factory line. Yeah, this is probably not a, you know, sort of something that uh, that you ever want to see people doing. But in, you know, two things you would say is that in work where fatigue really does make a difference to performance, that naps can be really valuable in making the difference between someone, you know, sort of making a consequential mistake and not. Um, the second thing is that even relatively short naps can have significant restorative benefits, right? Basically, if you're going to, if you're going to take a short nap, um, you want to make it like 20 minutes or less because any longer than that, you're going to fall into a deeper sleep and you're going to be groggy when you get up. Whereas 20 minutes is enough to give you a pretty noticeable sort of boost or recharge without that kind of sleep uh, hangover, so, you know, but, you know, you do have to have a boss and a workplace in which it's okay to do that. Yeah, I think I'm going to have a tough time pitching the four-day work week and my uh, hour-long walk and my 20-minute nap. They're going to just start thinking I might just be a slacker. <laughs> You know, I think if, uh, on the other hand, if you're able to get all the work done and you're a happier employee and you're not costing them, costing them as much in, you know, health insurance, then that would speak for itself. 
However, you know, I think that there were, you know, it's at, you know, it's definitely the case that not every place is able to do all of this. You know, very few places are. Um, but I think that the, you know, all of them offer different kinds of ways to, uh, you know, to bring a little more rest and recovery into or to the workplace in ways that will improve the work itself and or to benefit companies as well as individuals. So even if you can only do one of them, that's still, you know, that's still going to sort of benefit you, your company, your employers, um, or of and everybody. So there's a pretty big stigma around all these things that we're talking about in the United States. So maybe just talk about that and how you see people actually being able to overcome that as time goes on. Because again, if I told my business partner and I'll, I'll let you pitch them at the end of this episode, Hey, we want to go to a four day work week. Their mind instantly goes like, no, no, not doing that. Um, (laughs) So maybe just talk about that stigma that this rest, this recovery, this downtime for people, these vacations, they're a net positive for a company and a person, not a net negative cost right. suck. Well, you know, I think part, you know, part, part of the reason that we think of sort of reductions in work time or more vacations as things that automatically are going to cost companies is that in the past, we've won more of them mainly through or of, uh, uh, through things like sort of union negotiations, right? Contact contract negotiations. And so it's easy to see them as sort of, you know, to see more vacation as something that's been in a sense wrestled away from capital. Um, And so if you, you know, that's a, that's a kind of framing that is very old and which we're not even necessarily really aware of. Now, I think that it's a good question of why it is that we no longer or of take rest as seriously as we once did, or you know why it is that we don't sort of see a place for it in sort of in lives or careers. And I think that there are a couple of things that have happened over the last generation or two that have sort of pushed rest into sort of the or, or the, the margins of our daily lives. You know, one of them is that the structure of careers and our ideas about success have changed pretty dramatically, right? There used to be a time in the 1950s when America's two biggest companies, General Motors and General Electric, were both run by guys named Charlie Wilson, who had worked their way up from the mailroom or the bottoms of their companies up to or of the, you know, up to the top. And starting, especially in the 80s or so, that idea that you, you know, that success is a matter of putting in your time of sort of getting seniority that began to be challenged by, you know, attacks on labor unions, but also by, you know, industries like finance or the tech sector, where the model was, or you became rich very quickly at a young age through a combination of intelligence and luck and titanically long hours. It's also the case that, there were kind of structural things that have sort of uh, encouraged us to think m- more about sort of working longer or sort of pushing people to higher levels of productivity, right? You've got globalization, sort of the increasing precariousness of careers that have encouraged many of us to or of, you know, to want to seem busy at work even when we're not. Right to engage in what they call you know kind of performative busyness, and when you grow and you know and in a world in which fewer of us are making things or you know sort of working outdoors and more of us are working in offices on kind of intangible stuff, it's harder to have clear boundaries between work time and non-work time, and harder to know how productive you are or how productive one subordinate is versus another. And so working hours become a proxy then for or to productivity and or to commitment. And then the final thing is in the last, you know, 15 years or so with the advent of smartphones, 
it's now possible, you know, for us to carry our offices around in our pockets and be always on and always accessible. And so all of this together have made, or have, you know, made overwork seem lo and long hours seem like something that is inevitable and inescapable, right? It's something that everyone does and there is no alternative. And, but, you know, the, but a couple things have been responsible for kind of opening up a space to push back against that. One of them is demographic, right? What of the, you know, in particular, you see millennials and, and sort of, you know, and sort of Gen Z being less interested as a group in that kind of sort of always on, always working sort of career comes first sort of life. A second is, you know, was the pandemic, which forced lots of companies to, you know, very quickly change how they worked often faster and more profoundly than ever, than they ever thought possible, which has kind of opened, I think, opened up a space for thinking about, you know, are there ways in which we can positively change how we work? So, and one of those ways being sort of a shorter work week. And so I think it's the, you know, it's the, it's the combination of this, you know, of this long-term sort of demographic change in attitudes towards work combined with this sudden change in the last couple of years that demonstrated sort of the possibility of making changes that I think is responsible for sort of creating greater interest in rest, whether expressed through the four day week or through other things and has made it feel a little bit more urgent and a little bit more viable. Do you think that's because young people saw their parents going and grinding and doing the corporate thing? Most places, mom and dad now working. And they went, huh, that didn't make mom and dad happy, you know, working their great jobs, you know, that made them fight and bicker and be stressed out and anxious. Maybe I don't necessarily need to do all those things to kind of skip forward to happiness. Yeah, you know, I think that the or of that boomers, baby boomers like myself, though, I'm at the very tail end of the or of the baby boom that or of that our our examples were not always the most inspiring ones when it came to or of work life balance and that plenty of sort of you know plenty of younger workers sort of came into the workforce sort of a little more skeptical of of sort of the stories that or of older generations took for granted about sort of the necessity of uh, you know sort of uh, of sort of long hours and then i think that's only been reinforced as they've gotten older by having to deal with the challenges simultaneously of becoming parents themselves and having the pre the time pressures of children and often also having to deal with you know sort of those of us in the older generation who you know now need help whether it's you know resetting you know, resetting the internet in our homes or, or of, you know, um, more serious kinds of, you know, sort of health related sort of assistance. And so that, I think that all of that stuff sort of creates, creates a set of time demands and sort of, a, uh, but also sort of uh, that are hard to manage, but also creates a sense that, you know, maybe we don't need to do it the way that, our parents did, and we can, you know, and that if we can find something better, then sort of we'll be the happier for it. Well, to your point, our relationship with work has changed a lot just in the last couple of years, but let alone 50, 100, 400, you know, thousand years ago, work was so much different. So we all think, well, there's no possible way we could ever do something different. And as you stated, the 40 hour work week, that's pretty new. Uh, you know, they fought for those as laborers because sometimes they were in factories for 12 hours a day, six or seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So they made strides there. And now we think, that, oh, gosh, you can't work 12 hours a day for six days a week. That's insane. Um, so maybe in the future, people will also think oh, that's insane. They worked 40 hours, um, <laughs> you know, but there is the reality of things got to get done. I mean, somebody's got to build the semiconductors. Somebody's got to 
ship the packages. Someone has to do this, the heart surgeries. Um, so my concern, I guess, is, you know, if population declines, you know, how do we fix some of these holes that we have? Who knows the answer to that? Right. You know, one of the things that I, I think it, the, the four day week movement is still, or of it's still too small to see effects on, you know, across entire economies, but Certainly one of the reasons that, let's say, you know, business owners express an interest in it is a sense that, you know, starting a business, being in charge, these are really hard things, right? They, t they can take a pretty serious toll. And moving to a four-day week, they hope will kind of give them more runway. Um, or to make it possible for them to continue to doing work that fundamentally, you know, at bottom, when it goes well, they really love to do, and therefore have sort of longer careers than they would if they were sort of working long hours and then sort of you know sort of burning out when they were younger. I think that the uh, so there is you know you can envision of a future in which people are sort of staying using shorter working hours as a way of increasing participation in labor markets uh, at sort of old uh, at older ages and indeed this is something that we see in Japan right people retiring and then sort of the next week coming back as part timers in you know often in the often in the same jobs it's all so you know i think that the uh, that as this becomes sort of more accessible It'll be interesting to see if, you know, if the initial idea of the four day week as a way to sort of extend people's careers actually sort of does sort of does play out. The other thing, you know, in terms of labor scarcity, where the four day week intersects is that it is a way also of sort of bringing back into the workforce people who would sort of struggle to both work full-time and uh, to parent and you know in particular right exactly child care you know. is just crazy expensive i hear from people that are making as soon as you have like kid two you're like i'm staying home like i right. can't it's like two thousand dollars a week and you're like geez exactly you know, i don't, I don't so, make nearly enough for that to be justifiable yeah you know and so for you know the uh, that um for one thing, you know, working a four-day week means that there's another day that you don't necessarily you know, where you're not paying childcare, um, or you know, you are paying childcare and you're just having that time to yourself. Either choice can, you know, the, or people people make make both of those choices and or of you know, or they uh, whichever whichever one lets you live your best life. But you know, there is a viability to sort of work. You know, when you're working in a place that has a four day week, um, you know, as a working parent, it's possible to sort of be taken seriously as an employee in a way that you're not quite as much in a place that's working five days. If you're, you know, if you're the only person who is working on a reduced schedule and so, and there is a little bit of evidence for that suggests that some of these companies actually have a preference for hiring sort of working moms because often these are people who are a little bit underemployed. Um, they have, you know, serious skills, but they're, uh, but for you know, various reasons, it's harder for them to sort of be put onto really interesting projects or to manage large numbers of people commensurate with their skills in sort of five day week companies. And so there's an opportunity to sort of get, especially into smaller companies, you know, workers with a level of professional experience and training that they might not have access to sort of otherwise. And there's a sense that you know, what you need in a four day week company is not someone who can like sit in a chair for 12 hours a day, but someone who is ruthless about their time, who can prioritize, who can do one thing and knock it out and get on to the next thing, et cetera. And that, that's a sort of set of time management and soft skills that working 
or of uh, that working mothers and prof and or of you know professional moms or of have in abundance, and so or of they're going to be able to fit into this kind of environment or of really quickly, they'll they will recognize the value of working a four day week, and they're more and the calculation is they'll be more or of more loyal and or of harder to hire away because they have this additional time that they are going to consider sort of really valuable. I dig it. All right, Alex, this is your big uh, finale. Let's, um, let's make the pitch to my business partner. Let's make the pitch to my CFO. Why should our company, Mix Solutions, go to the four-day work week? So, you know, the case that I would make is that or if there are ways of... This is something that you can do that not only makes the company better, but it is something you can achieve at ridiculously low cost that essentially it's like a, you know, it's like of a perk that the employees generate themselves. So in terms of cost of implementation, it is one of the cheapest things you can do that has or of a material benefit both for or of your employees and or for the company. It's also a solution to some important challenges that lots of companies face, right? Recruitment and retention, or of work-life balance, um, or of employee engagement and happiness, employee health, all of those move in a positive direction when or of you implement a four-day week. The last thing I would say is that the four day, but you know, the four day week also only works if everybody does it. And so this isn't something that you are just giving to your employees, but it's, it's only really going to work if you also, you know, if you, your co-founder, your CFO, other executives, if you all do it together and the real, you know, the real secret of the four day week is that it's something that is created by every person in the company working together to make it happen. And so, you know, if you're, and even if you love what you do, being in a position where you can envision doing that for, you know, the next 30 or 40 years, rather than the next 10, and then having to, you know, spend a month in the hospital getting a new heart or, you know, or of recovering from burnout, I would say that that's going to give you a better life and let you be a better leader, a better person, a better entrepreneur. So that's the case I'd make. I appreciate that. My very brief addition to that case would be what I tell people all the time is you go into business to be happy. You know, everyone says, no, I go in to make money. Well, it's okay. You go into business to make money. Sure. Why do you want the money? Well, so I can buy things. Well, why do you want to buy things? Because they might make me happy. It's like, okay, well, let's just skip a couple of steps. We're doing it to be happy. Here's a pretty good route that we might be able to achieve an extra little bump in happiness. So, uh, well, Very wise. Alex, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so appreciative of your time. I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I think really what you're doing is trying to make businesses better and trying to make life for employees better, trying to make people happier. So I think it's a noble and worthwhile pursuit. And uh, I hope you can keep going at it and converting people one by one. Hey, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Alex. I really, really great to be on the show. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate you.